So we're in the chapter 8 dealing with vapor power cycles. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about just about how electricity is generated, okay? Because the vapor power plants and vapor power cycles are used primarily for power production to turn a shaft, and that shaft often drives a steam, not a steam, a steam turbine drives a shaft that, that turns an electric generator. So we want to talk about coal-fired nuclear power plants, concentrated solar power plants, and geothermal power plants. These we really don't see much in Texas. We see a lot of nuclear and a lot of coal-fired. Uh, then we'll talk about a review of the Carnot vapor power cycle. That was at the end of Chapter 5. Then emphasize temperature entropy diagram for steam. And... We'll talk about an ideal Rankine cycle. This is named after an individual, Rankine. I guess we could look him up on Wikipedia and take a look at his picture where he lived and all that. The ideal, meaning it's no irreversibilities in the pump or the turbine, and we're not going to superheat it. What comes out of the boiler will be saturated vapor. Then we'll talk about especially the thermal efficiency and the backwork ratio. These are metrics for the system and then we'll talk about irreversibilities even in the ideal Rankine cycle that's perplexing to a lot of students and then we'll compare the performance of the ideal Rankine with the Carnot see which one's better can you tell already which one's going to be better Carnot and then we're going to talk about enhancing the performance of the Rankine cycle by increasing the boiler pressure decreasing the condenser pressure, superheating, and reheat. I don't think we're going to have reheat. I think I'm just going to move reheat into the skip category. Regeneration, skip. Feed water heaters, skip. Steam traps, skip. Cogeneration, anything with exergy, exergetic efficiency, all of those are skips, okay? And thermoeconomics are skips. All right. In 2013, last year, electric generation in the United States was around 4 million kilowatt hours, 40 million, 400 million, 4 billion, or 40 billion kilowatt hours. It's almost like the national debt, right? Or the you know the debt of the United States. It's like it's so big you can't even fathom it, right? But when you start to bust it out, you figure out oh. Per working individual in the United States, the debt, national debt is, you know, $50,000. It's like, oh, or whatever it is. I don't know if it's $50,000. Then it gets real, right? Price of gas, eh, until you have to fill up your gas tank, right? And you got a 40 or 50-gallon gas tank instead of a 12-gallon gas tank, right? And now we're going to go take a look. D, <laughs> 4 billion kilowatt hours. It doesn't mean much to you. It doesn't mean much to you. What does a kilowatt hour cost you as a purchaser of electricity from City Public Service? Roughly. One kilowatt hour, what does it cost you? All right, I'm going to take numbers for this, and then we'll see how it goes. Who would like to be the first brave soul to raise their hand and tell me that the kilowatt hour is? How much do you have to pay in City of San Antonio residential kilowatt hour? How much? 0.15. What are the units on this? Is that 0.15 cents per kilowatt hour? 0.1. Okay, he gives up. Next. Yes. 35 what? 35 cents per kilowatt hour. Next person. Oh, you had to raise your hand. I'll get it. One point what? Of what? Dollars per kilowatt hour. Anybody else? Come on, let's have some uh, back row participation. Just throw out a number. Yes, sir. Eight cents. That would be a dollar zero point zero eight per kilowatt hour. Did you just Google it? Good guess. Educated guess. All right, it's about 10 cents. Just round it off to 10 cents. It's creeped up from 8 and it slowly got up. What they do is they put these extra little fuel charges in there. But if you take the total kilowatt hours, 
on your bill, yes, they tell you how many kilowatt hours you used last billing period, 28 days, 27 days, 31 days, whatever the billing period was, and it does change. They tell you the total usage, they tell you the amount, and then they have all these little lines, this and this tax, and this fuels adjustment, surcharge, blah, blah, blah. Sum it all up and do the math, and it's right at 10 cents kilowatt hour. How many people have ever lived in Houston or Dallas? Electric bills higher there? It is a little higher, and so we are getting a good bargain here in San Antonio. We're roughly a little lower than 10 cents kilowatt hour uh, average. It depends on fuel fluctuations. Most of the electricity generation in the United States was accomplished using coal. Coal, 40% in 2013. It's down a little bit. True or false, in the United States during 2013, about one-fifth of the electricity generated was accomplished using nuclear All right, true or false, in the United States during 2013, less than 0.1% of the electricity was generated using biomass fuel. What is biomass anyway? Corn. Corn stuff, yeah. Right? So what do you think? False, 1.5%, which I believe... I, ha I find a little hard to believe it's that high. So I'm interested what exactly is all the biomass that's generating. In 2013 in the state of Texas, how many nuclear power plants are there and that generate electricity? C. So it's four at two sites, true? There are two plants at near Glen Rose, that's the nearest city to Comanche Peak, the power plant. And there's two units at Bay City, which is the South Texas project. Let's just do a quick review on those. So if you go to South Texas Nuclear Generating Station Wikipedia site, there's a dot. That's where it's located. Where are we located? Not that far away. And then you can take a look at a little discussion on their site. They talk about the two pressurized water reactors, Westinghouse Design. The units are operational. There's two at 1250 megawatts. Those are pretty big. Two of them, each of them, 1250 megawatts. The units are planned, two new ones at 1358 megawatts. But you could read more on the site about how the planning went down the tubes, and there's really no action on it. Uh, let's go down here. What does the city of San Antonio own of that power plant? 40% ownership of that big workhorse is by City of San Antonio. Uh, city of Austin, uh, Austin Energy is 16%, and then NRG out of Houston is 44%. Okay, so that's the split of who owns that two units down at Bay City. Um, but you could talk about recent developments and how they had a license application, but the NRC is really not. They, they announced the cancellation of it of the in the spring of 2011, not that long ago. One of the biggest reasons for canceling, their shale natural gas production just drove the economics down the tubes, and then Fukushima, yeah, both of those, double whammy. There's Comanche Peak, red dot. Hey, what city is that close to? Dallas and Fort Worth, right? Can you see that close enough? And then we're down here. We don't get any nuclear power from Comanche Peak, although once you're out into the grid, ERCOT distributes power. They shift it around where it's needed so you don't have blackouts in some region. Who sells electricity in the San Antonio area? This is the question for the shyest person here that's never answered any question all semester. Who, who sells electricity in the San Antonio area? Do you think B? What do you think? CPS Energy. What is not one of the five top five largest Texas retail sellers of electricity? And this is based on old data. I didn't have time to update it, but Constellation New Energy, CPS Energy, ERCOT, TXU Energy, or Reliant. And this one I want everybody to participate. So one of these doesn't sell electricity to the retailer. 
to, to, to the customer like you. A re, they're not a retail seller. We have a vote for what? C and a D and an E. Reliant. Who, who's ever lived in Houston? All right. Is Reliant there? They, they sell electricity in Houston. Who ever lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area? TXU? Yeah, TXU. Uh, let's scratch them off. Who's lived in the San Antonio? Okay. So we're down to Constellation New Energy. I don't know anything about or ERCOT. What do you think? Let's just vote. A, you're voting wrong, people. C, oh, very good. And then what is, why C? ERCOT does not sell electricity. It's Electric Reliability Council of Texas. And what they do is they manage the grid. What is not true about CPS Energy? All of these statements are true except for one. Which is the false statement? We have a, a statement for, uh, for D. Did, which one? Hold it. Let's take them. D is a vote for D is false. D, one for A, one for A. This is a big statement, isn't it? It's the nation's largest municipally owned electric en uh, utility provider, energy utility provider, and serving both natural gas and electric service. That's very unique, and it's true. You live in a very unique region. It is, it is, you go to Houston, do they have a municipally owned utility provider in Houston? No, they don't at all. How about they don't have anything? Austin does, but if you go up to Dallas, Fort Worth, no. They have, you know, private companies that are utility providers. Now, once you're a municipally owned utility provider, uh, you can't, uh, you basically have a monopoly, but you're regulated monopoly by the PUC, Public Utility Commission. And there you go, you can go check out CPS Energy. Okay, sometimes energy sources have a good reputation or a bad reputation. I think we all know what we mean by kind of good and bad, right? Out there in the world, news articles, etc. Coal, good or bad? Bad. Nuclear, good or bad? It's bad. Natural gas? It's good. I mean, really, you brag about it, but it's a game of, uh, of a competing, I don't know, PR departments, right? So bad coal, bad natural gas, but anyway. Wind? It's got the good feeling. Okay, land-generated methane? No, it's good. Come on now. You're going to get trash. It's generating all that stuff, belching it out. You're just going to capture it, make electricity. It's renewable. It's green. It's Okay, solar photovoltaics. Uh, concentrated solar to make. Yeah, good. Okay, fine. Geothermal. You're just not going to find it around here. Oil. Oh, yeah, bad. Biomass and hydropower. This one is very debatable because they took it out of the green. It is no longer renewable. Hydroelectric is not renewable. Why? Not sustainable. It clogs up rivers. It prevents the natural flow. Salmon want to get up. They find a big concrete. Oh. <laughs> I want to jump. The, you know, I want to go swimming upstream and spawn and all that. And you just interrupted my life. So they've actually, in the state of Color, California, have taken some select dams that had a lot of silt buildup, took them out, let it flow, natural, get rid of the dams. So this one, a few years ago, good. Today, eh, bad. In 2013, what percentage of electricity used in San Antonio is generated with coal? Coal. Hey, that was the bad, wasn't it? We got a lot of 40s. It is 40%. Do you mean of the electricity used in this room right here for lighting, for air conditioning, is 40% coal? And you thought, you know, you were doing good, right? No, nah, you're using coal. 
All right. What percent of electricity used the San Antonio's nuclear? In this room, in this building, on this campus, over the year, last year, what percent was generated? It's surprisingly high. Coal-fired plant. So how does a coal-fired plant work? Well, you know, I'm going to try this. This may seem cheesy, but you can go to the Internet and really get good dy dynamics and graphics. And so basically coal comes into a pulverizer, spread into a firebox. It comes in just as fine a powder as you can smash it. And then blown in, and so it's a nice firebox going. Uh, you're going to have to take some ash out of that firebox, and you'll have to take the out the flu. And they try to do some stuff with the emissions to clean it up. They try to get uh, particulates out, mercury out, sulfur out. So they'll have like um, bag houses of precipitators so to help clean it up. Here they're showing a precipitator, electric plates, and then they attract ions and stuff. Okay, now here is water going through tubes, and that's a boiler. So in the furnace, you have a boiler. And it comes out at high pressure, high temperature steam, passes over the blades of a rotating steam turbine, turns the shaft to generate the electricity in the generator, and boom, there you go. Once it's passed through the steam turbine, it's low pressure. It's condensed in a condenser. It's usually cooled with other water, a different source of water, either going to a lake or a cooling tower. In Texas, we have a lot of lakes. We can build them. We use them. Uh, some other places, they have cooling towers. They don't have the footprint. The land is too valuable to make a 7,000-acre lake like they have at South Texas Project. That's a lot of land, 7,000 acres for one lake to cool your power plant. That's the purpose of the lake. You can't go fishing on it. I wish I could. There's a lot of wildlife down there. They say it's also a duck bird sanctuary because there's no hunting, no fishing, just a bunch of alligators chomping on the birds. But anyway, uh, up north, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, New York, they're not building a lot of lakes. They have cooling towers, smaller footprint. Condense it, put it through a pump, and put it through the loop, and there's your loop. So each vapor power plant or coal-fired power plant has a boiler, steam turbine, condenser, pump at least. Here's a uh, video uh, talking about a mammoth uh, power plant. Nuclear power. The reactor vessel with little rods going in and out. So they're going to control by the positioning of those uh, um, boron laced control rods, that's their name, control rods, by inserting and extracting them to get it to go critical and then get the power level up and then get it right there and hold it there and it, it'll it'll toast out the water, believe me. That water going through there will get very hot. There's a pressurizer mechanism just to keep it a high keep it the right pressure. But then, because it definitely expands as you're starting up and going through any dynamics, you don't want the system to go through dynamics. If you learn anything in your materials class, thermal stresses can be hard on machinery. So in a nuclear power plant, they get it up and they leave it constant, base load. Let it run, steady state. Very good for machinery to run a long time. And so once it's running, it's running. There's the big steam generator. And inside you have that primary loop. And then outside you have the turbine, the condenser, the pump, electricity generation going to a cooling tower or lake source. Hey, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission provided that image. How about concentrating solar? All you do is take the photons of the light, maybe put them in a trough, pass a tube through it, and that, that trough will continue to focus it's a simple concentrating solar so that you have a photo collector and it's just baking. You, know, you could use it for a hot water system on the roof of your house or you could make a massive system and try and make nuclear power out of it. Or they put a tower in a field and the field will be filled with a bunch of mirrors and the mirrors can then direct all of the light that hits on them up to a focal point. 
And so then they push a fluid that goes up and down, and it really gets toasted right there. That's your boiler. That fluid can really get hot. Sometimes they'll put a liquid metal through it so you don't have that phase change, that rapid or volumetric expansion going from liquid to vapor. But it'll come down, some fluid will come down and eventually get into steam, steam then into the, the loop for a, a turbine. Okay, So that's like concentrated solar vapor power plant. So what about a Carnot vapor power cycle? We have the four basic components. Boiler. You come out of the boiler and you pass it through a steam turbine. From the steam turbine, condenser. From the condenser, pump. Four main components, true? What comes out of the boiler? Saturated vapor. All right. What goes into the boiler? Saturated liquid. Where is the high pressure side? Everything over here is high pressure. And then the condenser and everything else is on the low pressure side. So you could number these states, number of them different ways. Uh, a lot of times you put one here, then you put state two there, then state three there, then state four there. True? And we want to put this on a temperature entropy diagram. There's our dome because we're having a vapor, a Carnot vapor power cycle. And you could put in right here state one. Okay, from state one to state two, it's a reversible steam turbine. It's adiabatic, reversible, adiabatic, isentropic, straight down on a TS diagram to state two. You're going to condense, but you're only going to condense partially because you put it through this special pump, and I'm going to call it a special pump. It's really kind of a half compressor and half pump such that when you reversibly compress it it's reversible blah 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 it just that didn't look so good let me bring it a little further over then it goes straight up to state four so it ends up to be perfectly saturated liquid at state four where below it is state three so typically a pump the condenser you take it all the way to saturated liquid but here it's not saturated liquid there's a quality at state 3 which is greater than 0 and there's a quality at state 2 which is less than 100 percent so there is your rectangular box for your Carnot vapor power cycle okay all right um, draw a line of constant pressure on this TS diagram does it look like this for my low pressure and does it look like this for my high pressure yeah those are two lines of high a constant pressure right so what do we have from four to one isothermal expansion then with from one to two what do we have isotropic or adiabatic expansion all of these are reversible all of these are reversible so adiabatic with the uh, reversible makes isentropic from two to three it's isothermal compression and three to four it's isentropic as well or adiabatic and reversible comp uh, boosting pressure you're changing the pressure you're boosting the, you're, it's a compression as well Okay, um, let's work a problem. So the Carnot vapor power cycle uh, with steam, water, you know, steam, 10 megapascal and 10 kilopascal are the two pressures. So um, saturated liquid enters the boiler at 10 megapascal, just like we had. I'll just quickly resketch that temperature entropy diagram. Put the dome right here. This is a line of 10 megapascal. This down here is a line of 10 kilopascal. So it enters at 
as saturated liquid into the boiler. Right there, we call that state four. Here's state one, here's state two, here's state three. There's our rectangle on a TS diagram for the Carnot. And saturated vapor enters the turbine, so that's one to two going into the turbine. If you want, I would go ahead and put them uh, boiler. I'll just put a box. Turbine, condenser. I'm going to call it pump, but it's kind of a funny name for a pump because it's a compressor as well as a pump. Okay. What is the work developed by the turbine in kilojoules per kilogram? That's what we're looking for is W, lowercase wt, true? Wt. Is that W dot out of the turbine per mass flow rate through the turbine? So right here is W dot out of the turbine. If this is state uh, 1, this is state 2, this is state 3, this is state 4, we neglect kinetic and potential energy effects. It's operating steady state. It's no heat transfer in the turbine. It's a change in the enthalpy, H1 minus H2. It comes in with high enthalpy, goes out with a lot lower enthalpy. Have you solved enough turbine problems to, to realize that? So that's how you calculate the answer for part A. How about for part B? The condenser heat transfer, lowercase q in the condenser, and I'm going to show it as an out because that's the direction of it. Why did I put a W dot there? Just put a lowercase w, t, a lowercase q, c for the condenser heat transfer. Do an energy balance around that condenser. It's transferred out to the cooling water. And that's equal to H2 minus H3. True or false? You like that? How about for the boiler, Q boiler, let's push that in because that's the direction it is. It's going to be H1 minus H4. And what about the, um, the, uh, the, um, we didn't do the work of the pump, W of the pump for the, yeah, let's call it the pump. That's going in, WP, that's going to be H. <clears throat> 4 minus H3. So now for part D, what is the thermal efficiency? Is that work net divided by Q in to the boiler? And the work net is the work out of the turbine minus the work to drive the pump, Q of the boiler. So that's how you calculate the thermal efficiency. And then the last is a new parameter, back work ratio. Back work ratio. The BWR, back work ratio, it stands for how much of the output from the turbine had to go back to drive the pump. And as an engineer, hopefully you see, oh yeah, we want a low back work ratio. Because what the turbine generates, we'd like to cell. All right. So you can get all of these in terms of these W's and Q's. What I encourage you to do is make a table to help organize your property calculations. And the table would be something like this. Have a state. Have maybe the pressure in some units, maybe kilopascal. Temperature in some units, degree C, working with uh, steam. Uh, maybe a, a, a enthalpy value, an entropy value, or a quality or a description, something like that, quality or description. And then, uh, so I have one, two, three, four states. Just to help organize, because sometimes you get lost. What do I know? What do I not know? And so let's start out. For state one, it's at what pressure? Do we know the pressure at state one? Yeah, it's 10,000 kilopascal or 10 megapascal. Do we know the temperature at state one? Well, you just look up T sat at that pressure. How about the enthalpy at state one? H of G at that pressure. How about S? 
S of G at the pressure and its saturated vapor, or you could say X is equal to 1. All right, what about state 2? Do I know the pressure, the temperature, the enthalpy, entropy? What's given in the problem statement? Which one of those are given? It's 10 kilopascal. The pressure is given. The pressure, true? Now, I ask that as an easy question, but I know it's not easy. You have to work through it in your own mind, okay? It, it's easy when somebody else points it out to you. There it is, 10 kilopascal. But a lot of times you have to struggle with it. All right, so now if it's at that, what is the temperature? It's the saturation temperature at that pressure, whatever it is at that 10 kilopascal. And then what about the enthalpy? What about the entropy? The S comes down because it's isentropic. S1 is equal to S2. And so this and this fix the state. This and this fix the state for state 1. The state 2 is fixed by knowing P and S. And then how would I calculate X? And I calculate X by S minus S of F divided by S F G. I ran out of room there, didn't I? Sorry about that. Maybe what I should do is uh, try to expand this a little bit. I'm going to erase some of this, erase some of this, okay? I'm going to try and grab this. Maybe it'll grab, move it up, and that frees up some room right here. So what is X? It's S minus S of F divided by S of G minus S of F. True? And then once I have that quality, I come over here for the H. It's H of F plus quality H of F G. Do you see how I'm kind of bouncing around the table filling it out? So sometimes I'll even write a column over here. I'll put fix. What? It's like, what did, it, what, what did I know to allow me to fix the state? And here I'll say it was P and X. What do I know on the second state? P and S. Pressure and entropy fix the state. What about state 3, which is out of the uh, condenser, but it's not fully condensed? You know the pressure? In this one, you almost have to go to 4 first. Solve 4 first, and then come back to 3. So if I go to 4... It's 10,000, and the quality was zero. It's saturated liquid, so I know this and that. So it's like I know pressure and quality. I'm able to look up SF, and that is the same. S3 and S4 are the same. So what allows me to fix state 3 is knowing the pressure, and the entropy. Pressure and entropy allow me to fix state 3. And then the same algorithm to get the quality at 3 and the uh, enthalpy at 3, just like the quality at 2 and the enthalpy at 2. Okay. All these look good. What's the uh, pressure, what's the temperature at the um, uh, 10 kilopascal? T sat. Let's fill in this number right here. What is that value? It's around 45.8 degrees C. Hot, cold. What do you think? Pretty hot, isn't it? Pretty warm. So what you're doing is, is if the water that's going through the condenser is going through at 45.8 degrees C. True. It's hot compared to my lake water. What's my lake water? 20 some degrees C, true? So I'm able to have a delta T which drives the heat and condenses in the condenser. It, there's a heat transfer out of the steam, out of my working fluid in the condenser. All right, let me ask a question. Somebody comes in here and they take a drill and they drill a hole in the tube at state two, the pipe. It's state two. 
put a hole in it, punctured it. Is steam going to squirt out of that tube, of that pipe at state two? Or is air going to rush in? Do you understand the question? Air will rush in. Air will rush in. Do you agree? Okay, anytime I have a, a, a pipe, right, and I say I have a pr atmospheric pressure out here, just pressure ATM, atmospheric pressure. And then inside I have some inside, right? And then I get a breach in the system. If it's high here, high pressure, compared to outside, the flow will go that way. If, if it's another case where the high pressure is on the outside, and it's low pressure in here, which way will the flow go? That way, true? So all, all it is is saying if I have a, if I poke a hole in that pipe, which side has a high pressure? Which side has a low pressure? It's around uh, 100 kPa out here. And it's about what? 10 kPa here. So which way is it going to rush? In. Air is going to rush in, and first time you think about that, you say that is not that doesn't make sense, does it? And I have been frustrated to no end teaching thermodynamics when this concept just never gets through to some students. I don't know how to help you to really understand this. You've got to put it into your own brain. But I will try my best right now. Okay. It's pure water. It's pure steam that's going through the pipes in the power plant. It's not water and air. They work real hard to get the air out. Air is considered a non-condensable. They'll have a blowdown process to get it out because sometimes it leaks in and you got to clean it out. You keep it out. You work hard as an engineer. So you have pure water. The water can be in the liquid phase or it could be in the vapor phase. True? But it's either one of those phases. And what's really, really interesting is, is that the only thing that exerts a pressure inside my pipes, inside my tubes, is the steam, is the water. And so if the, the pressure that makes that steam happy is lower than atmospheric pressure, so be it. It likes to be at 10 kPa at 45, did I say 45.8 degrees C? That's its happy point. Do you understand? It's it's saturated equilibrium. True? Okay. So um, maybe you've seen some things in uh, physics class or chemistry class. They're worth looking at. Have you ever seen somebody crush a 55-gallon drum? Just a little video. You can see some high school students standing around. What do they have? A 55-gallon drum. What is this tank right here? Propane. What do you think is going on right down here? Burner. It is burning. He's heating that up. What's coming out, wisping out white like that? They put water in it. It had air and a little water in the bottom. They put the propane. They're flaming it up. And they're blowing out. And guess what goes out as the little hole with a lot of that steam? Air. Right? So it's blowing out, getting rid of that. So what's filling up the tank after a while? Tight. What's filling Twist. the tank? Twist. Steam. What did they just put over the hole after they turned the heat off? Don't put the first, you know. They take the heat off, then they plug right. the hole. See? Now what are they going to do? They're going to pick it up, and they're going to move it to where? A kiddie pool. A little bat, you know, you're going to have some kids and they're going to enjoy that. They sell them at Walmart. It's so cheap. And there's ice and water there. And they're waiting for something to happen. Well, inside there is steam. It was all hot, but it was all at one ATM. Right? And now they sealed it. Air is not going back. And now they're cooling it. And they're waiting and waiting because they're kind of bored. And you see it goes on for 2 minutes and 33 seconds. He's, he's really afraid. Oh, she's afraid too. And uh, they say, he's telling her, okay, you get 
and take some of that water down there and splash it on top. And I'll, I'll stand over oh, here. No, just grab out of the, the way. Uh, ice you in with your hands. Uh, okay. And she says, uh, really? Yes, it's part of your grade. It's part of, you have to do it. Okay, I threw some ice cubes up top. You see it's ice. Okay, that is so I, I don't want to do this. You're going to get an A. Keep going. You're good. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm boosting your grade. Now, look how fast she ran away. That's not enough for an A, he says. So he takes a garden hose and he said, I've got to try and cool this down because if he can cool down the contents, what's going to happen? The water wants to go to a happy state. It wants to go to its happy state. Its happy state is saturated. It drops the pressure like you wouldn't believe. And then the outside pressure does what? The outside pressure crushes it. You created a vacuum in there. Some of the earliest steam engines operated not on the principle of getting pressure, high pressure. It's just getting vapor to replace the air and then getting sealing it and then cooling it. And it creates a large suction and that's your first steam engines used to pump. You don't want to waste your time on a 55 gallon drum. No problem. You probably have some of these laying around in your uh, house and that. And that is uh, soda cans. And you probably have a stove in your house. No problem. So you take the soda can after you've finished it, drank all of it, right? And you heat it up on a little uh, stove. And then you turn it over. And that's not the tweezers doing the crushing. It's the outside air doing the crushing. Same principle. What they do when they turn it upside down is they seal out so no air gets back in and it's going cold. It's cold. Can you see that? This is little high school kids. Right? So let me go back now to wherever I was in the lecture. Because sure, we can uh, do that. First of all, where is 1 ATM pressure? 1 ATM pressure is right up here at 100 kPa. So you got into a vacuum. Anytime you're below 100 kPa, you're in a state of a vacuum. All right. So now you wanted to show a, a pressure volume diagram. No, that experiment you just showed us. It starts right here. What is the pressure and what are the temperature? What is the pressure before you took away the heat and before you sealed the container? What was the pressure? It was 100 kPa. What was the temperature? 100 degrees C because it's water and it's just boiling in the bottom. There's still some little bit of water down here. It's liquid, right? Some of it's still boiling. You then plug it and you remove the heat. Now what happens? It's not going to stay 100 degrees C. It's going to try to go to the temperature of the ice you throw on it, the ice, or the water that the person sprays on it. Or if you just let it sit there, it'll go to outside ambient air temperature, right? But let's say it just wants to go to 20 degrees C. So two-phase mixture. What about the pressure? What's the pressure going to go to at 20 degrees C? What's it want to go to? You look it up. It wants to go to saturation of 2.5. Uh, Four or 2.34 uh, kPa. See what happens? That makes sense? So on a PV diagram, uh, let's put it out like this. Let's say we were uh, at, it was at, everything was 100 kPa, and you were somewhere in the dome. It doesn't matter. You could have had low quality, medium quality, High quality is typically higher quality because you don't have a lot of liquid in there. You just have enough because you don't want to burn a lot of propane to get the whole thing boiling, right? And so, and then when you throw ice on the outside, so you'd like it to be up in this vicinity. So now that's state one. What temperature again? 100 degrees C. Whoops, this is this is a line of temperature is equal to 100 degrees C. Right here is a 100 kilopascal. All right, so now you try and drop the specific volume 
once you seal it, the specific volume is not going to change, but you're going to drop it to a temperature of like 20 degrees C, two phase regions down to like two and a half kilopascal, 2.34 something kilopascal. There it is on a PV diagram. All right. I'm going to go ahead and pause for a minute. All right, we, we, uh, we plot a lot of these on the temperature entropy diagram, do we not? And you really need to look at one. This one I plotted, okay, I had to do it in MATLAB, generated this plot. And it's for steam, the steam temperature entropy diagram. Take a look at the entropy values. You can see the dome and how very symmetric it is. This is true to scale data. This agrees with your textbook. This is, And then you have the temperature going from zero all the way up. 600 I truncated you have 10 kilopascal 20 why do I put a big thick blue line for 100 kilopascal everything below that is a vacuum if you pop a hole in that pipe stuff is going in not coming out all right that's hard for students to grasp above that 200 kilopascal now you're getting up to be maybe a bomb if that thing pops it's gonna kill a bunch of people around there right up here is what point critical point and then you can see saturated liquid where the quality is zero, saturated vapor where the quality is one, and then just a couple intermediate quality lines put in there. Now notice, where does the four trace out one of these lines? Let's say the one megapascal line comes down, hits, comes across, hits. Where does it go from here? It kind of goes like this. Where does the two megapascal, it goes like that. Where's the this whole region, can you see how tight they are? There's a lot of lines in there, meaning that in the compressed liquid, once I have it compressed liquid, uh, if I put it through a pump and I'm, I'm at, let's say, this low pressure and I go to another higher pressure, it's like an insignificant temperature change and I'm there. So we always grossly exaggerate these lines over here. We, we kick them out. So we can kind of show you, oh, right here, and then I jump it up to there. Well, look how tight those lines are. Okay, can you have water at 200 degrees C and at 1 for entropy? Could you get water at that state right there? You wouldn't see it. It would be such a ridiculously high pressure. I can't even imagine ever getting there, right? So this is like no man's land. 100 megapascal is higher. Sure, I could put a 200 megapascal, but you see the trend, right? It, it's not going to be, you, this is like no man's land. Data, water doesn't exist at those states. But way out in here, it does exist. It does exist. It does exist, okay? All right, so let's take our Carnot problem. What was our pressures? 10 megapascal. Where's 10 megapascal on here? Well, it's somewhere between the 7 and the 13, right there, right there, okay? And then what did we kick it down to? The 10 kilopascal, here's your 10 kilopascal, there, 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 there. That's what the Carnot cycle looks like on a TS diagram that we just solved on a, for water, okay? If I want to pull it up in a PDF, this is the PDF. I can even blow it up a little bit. And you can see that, yes, there are different lines in this region. I wanted to make that a thicker line for the saturated uh, um, liquid. Maybe I shouldn't have, but yes, you can see that they do have slightly different lines in that region. So there are just a lot of lines tucked in there. True? So there you go. Let's get back to it. We now talk about a practical Carnot with steam. They call it the ideal Rankine. You're going to deviate from the Carnot. You can't achieve. You don't have a pump that can do that. You don't have a pump that can ingest a two-phase mixture. A pump wants saturated liquid. So on the TS diagram, instead of, maybe I just jump back there to the TS diagram, Instead of stopping right here on the condensing, you go all the way over to here. That's what you now feed the pump. So this was state one. 
This is state two. This is the new state three. And when you pressurize it, right there is state four. And now when you go through the boiler, state four goes all up, 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 till it hits right there, and then it comes across. So that's what they call the ideal Rankine cycle. Why Rankine? That's the name of a faculty. We could look him up on Wikipedia. Should we do that? Oh, there's this picture. Uh, what years did he live? 1820 to 1872. He was Scottish. And uh, he did a lot of work. Contemporary looks like of Clausius and, and Lord Kelvin. And thermodynamics, there he is. Did a lot with heat engines. Here's the problem. Instead of having a Carnot at the same two pressures, have an ideal Rankine cycle where you have 10 megapascal and 100 kilopascal. That temperature entropy diagram, the dome, the 10 megapascal, you kind of feed it saturated vapor into the turbine at state one, comes straight down. It's an ideal meaning that that turbine is reversible. And then come over here to state three to four, and that's a gross exaggeration. The distance between three and four is a gross exaggeration. But if it's reversible, what is the change in S? It's straight above. It's straight above. But an insignificant change in temperature. But then you go four all the way across. So four to one, the boiler starts at low temperature and goes all the way out at TSAT at that 100 megapascal, or 10 megapascal, right? Right. Same type of questions right here. The turbine, the condenser, the pump, the boiler, the thermal efficiency, the back work ratio. Uh, what you really want is you want to be able to put a table of properties together. Uh, what would that table look like? I like to put fix to remind me how I fix that state, the state number, uh, the uh, pressure, and often I have to pick a unit. Uh, I'll, sometimes I'll do this. If I think I'm going to make an error, I'll put the pressure in kilopascal. I'll put the pressure in bar, and I'll put the pressure in megapascal, especially if I'm doing this in Excel or a spreadsheet. Why do I put them all three there? I can triple, quadruple check my pressure conversions because I've made so many errors on pressures in the past. And then the same thing is you could do this. You could put temperature in degree C. You could put temperature in Kelvin. Right? And then now I ran out of room on my table. I, I apologize. So let me try and copy that table if I can and scoot it over. All right. Maybe move it down a little. Okay. So I want finally to get the enthalpy and kilojoules per kilogram. I'm probably going to need to know entropy, kilojoules per kilogram, Kelvin. Uh, I may need a description or quality. Let's talk about state one, state two, state three, and state four. Everything is reversible. No irreversibilities in the turbine or the pump. So I start walking through the system. Oh, they told me it's 10 megapascal. And they told me it was 10 kilopascal, 10 kilopascal, 10 megapascals. Populate the table. And they also told me saturated vapor enters the turbine. That's at state one entering the turbine. Saturated vapor. So the quality is one. The saturated liquid exits the condenser. That's at three, zero. Quality at state three is zero. So this information and that information, pressure and quality fix state one. And pressure and quality fix state three. Right? What other information did they give me? Not much. I can look up entropy, S1, and from a second law analysis of that turbine going through from 1 to 2, S2 is equal to S1. And because S2 now is equal to S1, 
this actually and this fixed state two. So the pressure and the entropy fixed state two. And now I can get everything else conceptually for state four. That's a little different from three to four. What was that? That was through my pump, right? So I have a pump. I'm coming in state three. I'm going out state four. I know the pressure at four, 10 megapascals. I know the pressure at three, 10 kilopascal. How do I fix state four? Yes, go with entropy and say, so S3 is equal to S4, all right? And if you're in a computer code, you're done. But by hand, in the tables, you'll be frustrated to no end. So you use the last result out of Chapter 3 that said W over M or lower W dot over M dot or lowercase uh, interrev uh, is uh, lowercase W is equal to minus the integral VDP. Isn't that what we have going on in the pump? It's a flow through a control volume around the pump, and it's reversible and adiabatic, negligible changes of potential and kinetic energy, kaboom, I have minus integral VDP. And why is that so good for liquid water flowing through the pump? Because I can do that integral because V is essentially constant. V is, it's incompressible. So V comes out, now I can do that integral. So it's equal to minus V, P4 minus P3. Why the minus sign? It's work not out of the pump, but into the pump. This is a positive pressure change. If I'm working in kilopascals for the pressure, and I'm working in meters cubed per kilogram for the volume, I get kilojoules per kilogram for units. Please make sure you work a lot of problems and all that makes sense to you, right? Because you, you need to solve problems accurately and timely on the exam. Did all that make sense? Okay, so basically it's kind of a roundabout when you analyze the pump is you get the work of the pump first, and then you know the work of the pump is equal to the H4 minus H3, except for a minus sign because I, I, uh, I like to work with a positive work into the pump. So um, there, that'll fix it. Okay, now I'm consistent on all my signs. So it's kind of funny. I know the pressure... And I'll actually get the enthalpy, H4. H4 is H3 plus WP. What's WP? VDP. Look at this. This equation, H4 is equal to H3 plus WP. Uh, okay, it's a minus sign there. Get rid of that. Still got that minus sign right there. What is H, uh, W3, I mean, WP, it's uh, VP4 plus P3. The minus signs finally canceled each other. So that's how you get H4. So that's really uh, enough to fix the state. And really, all I really cared about were, were the H's anyway. And so now I have all my properties. I can get turbine work, condenser work, pump work, boiler, heat transfer, uh, uh, did I say condenser work? It's condenser heat transfer, thermal efficiency, and back work ratio. What was the back work ratio of the Carnot? 37%. What's the back work ratio of the ideal Rankine between the same two pressures? It's way down at 1.1%. Okay. That's a significant improvement. It's a significant reduction in the back work ratio. Now, the thermal efficiency of the Carnot was um, high. It's the highest. It was 45.4%. And the thermal efficiency now of this ideal Rankine drops from 45 down to 37.2%. Uh, That's also a significant change. At this point, a lot of people will say, I thought you said it was ideal. I thought you said the pump was reversible. You can't get a better pump. And I thought you said the turbine was reversible. You can't get a better turbine. 
and we have the high pressures the same for both systems, the low pressures the same for both systems, why aren't the efficiencies the same? Do you see that question? There are irreversibilities in the ideal Rankine cycle. That's the only explanation why the efficiency of the ideal Rankine is less than the efficiency of the Carnot. There has to be some irreversibilities. But it's not in the pump and it's not in the turbine. Where's it at? It's in the heat transfer. If this is the Carnot. Remember the box right here. Where did we bring in the heat in the Carnot? From this state to this state, from 4 to 1. Heat in, heat in, heat in, heat in, heat in, heat in, right? Did all the heat in come in at the high temperature, TH? 100% of the heat come in at high temperature? Yes. Now we go to the Rankine, the ideal Rankine. Where is state four? It's shifted way down here. What temperature is it? Oh, it's low. It's like uh, 50 degrees C. Do I have to put some heat in before it gets up to 75 C? Do I have to put some heat in before it gets up to 100 degrees C? Do I have to put more heat, more heat, more heat, more heat, more heat, even until it gets up in the 300 degrees C? It's 311 is the uh, saturation temperature, right? So all of that heat in the liquid before it gets up to saturated liquid, all of that heat's coming in at lower temperatures. That's where you have the irreversibilities. So if you're burning a fuel, let's say the fuel just had to be a perfect 311 degrees C, it could still heat up the fuel, the water as it uh, changed phase, but there's a large delta T, an increasingly large delta T, of heating the liquid. And when you do thermo 2, guess what one of the enhancements to performance will be? Right there, it'll say, let's preheat the feed water. Let's not use our valuable coal or, or whatever fuel we're using to heat up the feed water. Let's use some other source of heat internal to the cycle to heat up the feed water. And because this is a great source of irreversibility and a degradation in the overall system performance. Make sense? So are there irreversibilities in the turbine and in the pump? Yes. As soon as you get rid of ideal right here in front of the Rankine, then it's open. You can Somebody can say, oh, yeah, now we're going to have the efficiency of the turbine is 88%. Oh, now we're going to have the efficiency of the pump is, uh, I don't know, 72%. He makes up some numbers, right? What does that do to our TS diagram? And what does it do to our calculations? Well, on a TS diagram, it kicks it over to here. There's state 2 right now. This now becomes state 2S, doesn't it? And over here, I know that it's hard to show, but there will be a 4 and a 4S. 4S will be directly above it. Right here is 3. 4S will be directly above it, and 4 actual will be a little bit with to increasing entropy, but on the same pressure, high pressure line. All right, so... You could then do some calculations for a ranking cycle that had efficiency for the turbine and for the pump. How do you improve performance? You increase boiler pressure and you decrease condenser pressure. You could see that from the Carnot, bring in all the heat as high a temperature as possible. If you increase the boiler pressure, yeah, your fuel has to be hotter to bring in the heat at that higher temperature, but it's going to be great for performance. So, good for performance. Boost up the boiler pressure. Condenser pressure, take it down, decrease it. How do you decrease the condenser pressure? 
Well, this was to the first one for the increased boiler pressures make your fuel, fuel is basically burn it hotter. So you just have to have some water that's cooler. All right. Now, it doesn't make any sense. You'll never make money by putting ice cubes in that cooling water. It'll never work. But what you want to do is reduce the thermal resistance such that the condenser temperature is as low as your lake water temperature or closer to the lake water temperature or closer to the outdoor ambient temperature. And if you work for a power plant that makes electricity, you'll actually see the fluctuation because the coal burns just as hot in the middle of December as in the middle of August. Okay, they're going to continue to have metallurgical considerations on your equipment for the high temperature in the furnace. But the lake water fluctuates. December, it's actually cooler lake water in Texas than in August. So basically it runs a little better in the winter because of the cooler uh, lake water temperature. Let me just expose you to this and then stop. You can superheat. It's all natural extension, right? Instead of stopping here at saturated vapor, just go out. Then if you isentropically expand it, boom. Or even go further, superheat, boom. Superheat, boom. It's just now the temperature is going way up. Okay? A lot of times you stop based on metallurgical considerations. There's a lot of material in this chapter that we're skipping. Put reheat and superheat in that category. But everything else, fair game. When is our exam? Thursday. We'll see you then. Thank you.